Hello, ladies and gents, Hagbard Celine here on another beautiful day, and I have before me, frankly, something I, I wish I didn't. I woke up this morning to a private message from someone who requested to remain nameless about the Princeton professor, whose name I still won't be attempting to pronounce, that I had done a video on just three days before. She apparently was invited just a few days after that to a TEDx. And as everyone knows, I am just such a big fan of TEDx that I had to watch it. And I guess when they told her that she was not allowed to speak for 45 minutes or so and had to shorten it to approximately 15 or 16, what she decided to do was amp up the rhetoric. It is so emotionally driven. Frankly speaking, it's raw demagoguery. It is an appeal to the emotional impact of her words in favor of any rational argument because I believe that they're starting to realize that they don't have a rational argument. What I'm going to do in this is attempt to avoid any sort of racial arguments. All I'm going to do is analyze her rhetoric because it's, frankly, it's amazing. I... You know what, just, let's just play it and let's see. What the hell was that, TEDx? Hello. Well, hello again, love. How are you doing? On April 12, 1865, the American Civil War came to an end when the Union Army officially accepted the unconditional surrender of the Confederacy. Okay, well, we're just going to start this history lesson at a random point then. Go on. At the steps of a courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia, the Union Army led by 200,000 black soldiers... How powerful of them to have managed to lead the Union Army of 2.4 million whites. Destroyed the institution of slavery, and as a result of their victory, black people were no longer property, but were now to be citizens of the United States. And now essentially, what we're going to be seeing throughout the rest of this speech is, her point is, that's not enough. The right to vote is not enough. The Civil Rights Acts are not enough. Just, just watch. The Civil Rights Act of 1866, the first declaration of civil rights in the United States, read in part, quote, citizens of every race and color, without regard to any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude, the language which was included to be inclusive to the Chinese indentured servants, almost 350,000 of which were brought over under the ticket system, and the Irish indentured servants, who were not considered white at the time. Shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to full and equal benefit of the laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. At least she was honest enough to say, in part, because the part she's leaving out is that they would also be held to the same standards and be responsible under penalty of law in the same as white citizens. 150 years later to the day, on April 12th, 2015, Hmm, well, you're stretching there somehow because it actually passed on April 9th, so I know it's convenient to say what you just said, but it's not really factually accurate now, is it? Now, it's neither factually accurate simply using the calendar date, nor is it mathematically accurate using the number of days in every year plus leap years between those two years. So you're just using this as a rhetorical device. 217 miles north of the Appomattox Courthouse, where the Civil War finally came to an end, Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old black man, was chased by Baltimore police. His crime? Making eye contact with the police and running away. 
As a 23-year-old white man, I have once been detained by the police for making eye contact and then making a move to escape police presence. This is considered suspicious behavior. At 9 a.m., Freddie Gray was caught by police and loaded into a van. By the time he emerged from the van 45 minutes later, 80% of his spinal cord had been severed, his neck almost snapped in half. Now, I know that people in Baltimore know the story of Freddie Gray better than I do. It's beginning to look like I might know the story of Freddie Gray better than you do, because the driver of that van, as discussed previously, was also a person of color. Does him simultaneously being a cop give him no right to his POC card? But I think that his death and the subsequent hung jury in the first trial regarding his death symbolize the continued racial inequality experienced by most black people in this country. The only way to say this and believe it is to ignore the fact that approximately 50% of the people in that trial were people of color. Hell, one of them is a woman of color. And we all know that's better than just a person of color, right? In other words, the span of time from the end of the Civil War and the inception of rights of black citizenship to the state-sanctioned beating and torture of Freddie Gray. Cool grave standing there. You want to keep that up? It's really fucking endearing. Go on, let the emotional rhetoric flow. Symbolizes the very real difference between formal equality before the law and the self-determination and self-possession that is inherent in actual freedom. As someone who has mingled with the law, let me explain to you. Once the police are involved, you lose self-determination and self-possession. That's part of being arrested. The right to be free from oppression, the right to make determinations about your life free from duress, coercion, or threat of harm. Does does that include the threats, coercion, and harm done by the inner city gangs that perhaps had, you know, cajoled Freddie Gray into being their lookout for heroin deals and on several occasions for distributing narcotics himself? I'm not for the war on drugs, but I also do understand that when I was part of the game, being arrested was indeed one of the consequences I was prepared to face. And resisting arrest and running from the police was not one of the behaviors I chose to partake in because it has such a high cost. 150 years after emancipation, the country still requires a movement that makes the most basic of claims that black lives matter. Mind you, you're the one who claims that it is required. You're the one making that claim. That's not a factual claim. That's your opinion. The question must be asked then whether or not the United States is actually capable. Oh, here comes some of that sweet, sweet, pure Marxist demagoguery. Mmm, eat it up. Of transforming the platitudes of freedom into actual rights for whom access is not determined by race or class status. Aha, uh -huh. now she has brought in her second rhetorical device, which is that race and class are somehow interminably linked, which means that obviously white people are wealthy and all black people are poor. Either that or she's making the claim that we have a race-based caste system in this fucking country, which, which would be am amazing considering what she's about to go on and say. On at least some level, we have to consider that if our government were actually interested in freedom for the vast majority of black people, it would exist. I used to be wildly wary when the right wing would use the word freedom because I grew up under the concept that if someone says freedom, be careful. They're trying to sell you something or take something from you. And now you're doing the exact same thing. You're trying to sell me something or take something from me 
under the guise of a good principle you yourself do not hold. But the promise of freedom assumes that it actually existed in the United States in the first place. Oh, I'm sure this is going to get good. In fact, black people were not freed into a just society. Black people were not freed into an American dream. We were freed into what Malcolm X described as an American nightmare. Well, I mean, fully understanding Malcolm X's perspective, you'd have to understand he saw the country as completely overrun by the creations of Jacob, a scientist from the Old Testament that created white people to be slaves and servants to the kings that were black. You see, so by his approximation, he was living under genetically aberrant slaves that had run amok. So I, I, would, I would feel that way too, I imagine. Far from being the land of the free, we live in a land of savage inequalities, where 400 billionaires live alongside 45 million poor people. Now we have seamlessly flowed back into Marxist ideology while completely abandoning the racial rhetoric just to drive the point home to a larger audience of Marxist-leaning lefts in America. Since 2007, 10 million people have been displaced from their homes by the foreclosure crisis. 56% of which were white non-Hispanic. 46 million people live on food stamps. Yes, the majority of which, as has been repeatedly pointed out to me by people that think I am a racist, are white. How does this have anything to do whatsoever with the Black Lives Matter movement, black empowerment, etc. that you've been going on about before all this? The list of inequities could continue, but the point is plain that black people were not freed into a country of unfettered opportunity. That's... That's funny, because what that made clear to me was that nobody has access to unfettered opportunity. And it's the economic inequality at the heart of American capitalism that is often obscured by racial inequality. Wait, so racial inequality is hidden by economic inequality, or economic inequality is hidden by racial inequality, or did you not intend to use the word obscured? Just, just curious here. I know I'm nitpicking, but yeah. Because when black people are 27% of the 45 million poor people in the U.S., we are told it's because of black culture. And it is utterly impossible that that plays even a bit into the equation. Not at all. It's purely based on the racist capitalist system put in place by the patriarchy, or... I don't know anymore. It is because black people are lazy. You, you couldn't have found even a half-believable compromise of a straw man? You're just gonna beat the old 1950s straw man that absolutely nobody listens to anymore? Jesus. And this prompts us to interrogate interrogate the morality of black people and not a system that produces 45 million poor people in the first place. So is your theorem all poor people are treated like black people and thus equally oppressed, or is it that black people are all inherently poor? I'm not sure what you're positing here, but either way it's completely ridiculous. This stereotyping of African Americans is not, however, only about poverty. It shapes all of the public perceptions of black people. And so not only do these racist characterizations hide the systemic nature of black inequality, but they also contribute to an atmosphere that regards black people as a menace, as criminals, and generally as a problem population that must be patrolled and policed. Well. You heard her, ladies and gents. Let's pull all of the police forces out of all predominantly black neighborhoods. Absolutely nothing will go wrong. They will self-police and self-correct, and everything will be fine. Our society will totally be fine. What are you even talking about? They're not viewed as a problem population because of a race. 
it's viewed as a problem because these areas have huge problems. White, black, brown, yellow, red, in fucking different. If these regions have large problems with crime, guess what? The cops are there. The police as an institution have fully absorbed these stereotypes of, and racism as it pertains to African Americans. There really is no other way to understand the casual disregard for black life in the hands of the police. Again, we've returned to utterly race-based rhetoric that isn't held up by any observable fact. As someone who has seen how the police operate, let me ensure you, we're all equally not people once in their custody. If you would like to discuss that issue, I am more than happy to sit down and discuss police brutality as a whole with any activist. However, if you're going to pretend like it's special time, I don't want to hear it. I've seen every race abused and mistreated by every other race of police officer, control officer, corrections officer, etc., etc., up and down the line. Do not pretend it's racially motivated. Consider how Michael Slager, Officer Michael Slaver, Slager in South Carolina, took aim as, he were, as if he were doing target practice when he shot a fleeing Walter Scott eight times in the back. If you would like to discuss police policy that allows police officers to shoot felons that are fleeing, I will sit down and have that discussion with you. If you want to make it racially motivated, fuck right the fuck off. I do find it wildly amusing that you felt it necessary to name the officer when he happened to be white. However, back when we were discussing the Freddie Gray case, all you discussed was the victim because he happened to be black. Recall how 12-year-old Tamir Rice Google Nick King. It's not racially motivated. Stop using your emotional rhetoric to get your points across. Was shot within 1.6 seconds of the police arriving on the scene. But more importantly, remember how he lay dying unattended as two police officers stood passively by, refusing to help him. Refusing, eh? It's not that police officers aren't necessarily required to be CPR or even extensive first aid certified, right? It's not that they'd already contacted for the shooting and dispatch had released an ambulance, right? You do understand that these cops are not medical professionals, right? A handful of these cases have become well known to people across the country, but they cannot convey the daily terror brutality and humiliation at the hands of the police that course through black communities across this country. I mean, in all seriousness, I have some respect for her use of language here, but to any analytical viewer, you're just going to see it for what it is. Complete and utter emotionally driven nonsense. All of this has contributed to the eruption of the Black Lives Matter movement eruption it's it's really quite interesting the way you use language to convey these things but it's it's really not an efficient use of the language and it is the movement that has exposed to the world what black america has always known the police are not intended to preserve law and order they are agents of lawlessness and disorder Yes, it is the police in Baltimore, Chicago, Detroit, Orlando, New York, and L.A. that are the true agents of chaos here, right? I mean, that's, that's logical. Jesus, at least in the Illuminatus, the guy doesn't have the balls to just walk up and shoot the cop because he actually recognizes that the cop is a human being, too. They are not out of control. Instead, they have been unleashed in poor and working-class black communities. Yes, they've been unleashed on these communities. That's, that's the way to describe what's happening. And for those of you who think I'm exaggerating, consider this. Over the last decade, 
The city of Chicago has paid more than $500 million to settle police brutality lawsuits. In 10 years, New York City has paid, on average, $100 million a year to settle police brutality and misconduct cases. Police murder and violence are simply the cost of doing business in cities across the country. Yeah, that's about how the gangs view it as well. Of course, there's, there's no way that the gangs are the one terrorizing these regions. Not at all. Because any other public institution, including hospitals, clinics, libraries, schools, responsible for that kind of debt and misconduct would have their budgets cut and their employees fired. And commence the idiots applauding the destruction and financial depletion of our entire police force during a time of financial strife. That's, that's a good idea. When the Chicago public schools were facing a billion dollar deficit in 2013, Mayor Rahm Emanuel closed 52 public schools, but no one dare suggest closing police precincts because they are too costly. While I am not in favor of closing any public schools that allow access to education, especially in lower income regions of the country, I don't see how depleting the police force would have helped either. And these issues are related because when you close schools and you close hospitals and libraries, when you provide no jobs, when you keep people in segregated, substandard, lead-infested housing, you are creating the conditions that justify the presence of the police. You are not transforming those conditions that create crime in the first place. So we're just we're just not going to address why they're in public housing, or? And when the most powerful country in the world cannot reign in its police, it is not because they cannot, it is because they will not. In 2015, American police last year killed 1,134 people. Only a proportionate 15% of which were black, and only a proportionate 25% of which were listed as unarmed. Please stop using Al Jazeera's statistics. Young black men were nine times more likely to be killed by police than other Americans. What did I just say about using Al Jazeera's statistics? You must know that they are fucking about with them. Properly analyzed per capita, others have even discovered that the Native American male is statistically 10 or 12 times as likely as a white man. But these numbers are just the tip of the iceberg. According to the findings of a study conducted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics on Police Homicides, in the years 2003 to 2009 and 2011, American police killed 7,427 people. That's an average of 928 people a year. So you're only going to pull the statistics from about the last decade, are you? I'm hoping you're not going to make a long-draw historical conclusion from this. And if you add that average up, for 2010, 2012, 2013 and 2014, we are talking about over 11,000 people killed by the police in the last 11 years. A disproportionate number of them black and brown. Disproportionate by racial statistics, not disproportionate by crime statistics. And certainly not disproportionate by the statistics of people that shoot back at the cops. Consider that in 2014, 58 American soldiers were killed in Iraq. Begin the false equivalence. Or that 78 people were killed by law enforcement in Canada in 2014. Or that from 2010 to 2014, in police in England killed four people. In Germany, the police killed no one in 2013 and 2014. 
in China with a population four and a half times the size of the United States. The police killed 12 people in 2014. Well, we are lucky that the only differences between us and China are how violent our police are, huh? So there has never been a golden age of good policing in the United States that we can point to where the police were killing on average that number of people or not killing one at all. While it is certainly true, your second statement, that we cannot point to a period in history when the police killed no one at all, we can, however, look at the periods pre- and post-prohibition and see that, aside from that period, police killed significantly fewer people than they kill today. But, of course, you're just going to ignore the fact that we actually do have statistics long form of our history and just focus on the inequalities faced today, in spite of the fact that your whole statement was just based on the fact that, in theory, I couldn't find what I just found with one Google search. Because the police have always reflected the racism, inequality, and brutality that exist in this country. And it's happening at a time of unprecedented black political power. And here is the portion of the event that completely contradicts the concept that they are an oppressed and underrepresented peoples in America, and specifically in cities like the one she's standing in, Baltimore. But of course she's going to ignore that and just say that the problems didn't get solved because reasons. We have more black elected officials in Congress state houses, and local government than in any other time in this country's history. The president is black. The nation's top law enforcement officer is black. And this was the fulfillment of a strategy at the end of the 1960s that called for black control of black communities. That we should have our own politicians, our own elected officials. Well, it's been almost 50 years, and I think that we can say that that strategy has failed. Well. You heard the lady. Apparently, black people make poor representatives for other black people, or something. Because when a black mayor of Baltimore calls for the National Guard, a unit that is led by a black woman, to put down a rebellion of black youngsters and black millennials, then we have come to the end of one phase of the black movement, and we are entering into another. Well, how dare those two damned race traitors ignore their blackness and do their civil duty? It's fucking awful. I don't know how they live with themselves. It's, it's really kind of disgusting. Now, mind you, she's going to hold fast to this rebellion line. What we are witnessing here is the willful, intentional, and real-time rewriting of a historical event. She's calling the riots in Baltimore a rebellion. Many like to compare the movement of today with the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But the Baltimore rebellion of last April conjured up memories, for me at least, of the rebellions of the 1960s. Oh, oh, so this event is nothing like the civil rights groups of the 1960s. It's just like the civil rights movement's more extreme fringe in 1960. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Because African Americans then, like today, were not fighting, at the end of the 60s, were not fighting Jim Crow or legal discrimination. But they were struggling against the injustice of poverty, unemployment, substandard housing and police brutality, none of which was against the law, but all of which was at the root of black hardship. You just gave the definition for socioeconomic hardship and proclaimed it as the definition of just black hardship, you fucking bigot. And so whether you agree or do not agree with the uprising is not important. What is important is what the rebellion communicated about justice, freedom, and equality in our country. But I ask you to consider the rebellion also in the way that Martin Luther King Jr. did in the 1960s. <laughs> Be very, very careful quoting the old Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., dear. As it were, many of his quotes are considered problematic and not inclusive enough. 
And as we prepare to celebrate his birthday on Monday, I want to end with a quote from him that was, that was from an article he wrote in the aftermath of a Detroit uprising in 1967. She goes on to take Martin Luther King's words well out of context for their time and use them to support the actual actions of the Detroit riots in 1967, wherein they had regularly attacked firefighters, ambulance operators, destroyed hundreds of businesses, and killed random people attempting to dissuade them from destroying their businesses. It does sound familiar, and it does sound like a repeat of history, but it sounds more like the first time you did it, it didn't accomplish a whole fuck of a lot because we're sitting here still dealing with it right now. So maybe, just maybe, that's not the method to enact the change you so desire. Maybe burning, looting, assaulting, and killing people is indeed not the way to bring about the civil change you so desire. Maybe you should cut that shit out and actually enact some change within your own communities and thus society as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed. This will be the last time I visit this woman's fucking ideals. She drives me up the wall by constantly conflating the idea of class and race as though they were interchangeable. They are not. The statistics do not bear your ideas out. Stop proliferating them as though they were fact. You're a demagogue. The worst kind of demagogue. The type of demagogue that would have been run out of ancient Greece by vote of the council for inciting violence within a democracy. You're not helping. You're making it worse. All right, with that, everyone, I will see you on Saturday, and I hope you have a lovely day.